So next up, I'd like to invite some wonderful humans to join me on the stage as we take a look into how the music industry is addressing the climate crisis. Who are the people behind some of the leading initiatives and the organizations? What are they doing currently? And what are the opportunities in the future? Please welcome Sophie Snap, Will Hutton, Carly McClacton, and Theresa Moore. Hi guys. Hi. Uh, so we've got some pretty amazing minds up here today and I'm very excited to speak to you all. We've done some kind of prep calls and there's a lot to get into. So we'll have some time at the end for Q&As, but really I want to kind of jump into it with you guys and we'll go round and if you wouldn't mind just kind of highlighting maybe one project and telling us a little bit more about what that project is and what you've been doing. So Carly, we can start with you. Thanks very much. Yeah, so the, the main project for us is this bit of work with Massive Attack where um, we looked at their, their tour and mm -hmm. kind of ran scenarios on how they could reduce emissions from their own tour. But what they really wanted to do was to try and support like wider change in the industry. So uh, we worked to develop this low carbon roadmap uh, looking at the stuff that you move around and the people you move around, um, the energy consumption at, at venues and sites and audience travel and looking at ways to reduce across all three of those. Amazing. And could you tell us maybe a couple of key points that came out of that? So what were some of the, maybe the, the more impactful changes and also maybe on a scale of how easy and hard some of those bigger impact things were, did you find that there were some things that had loads of impact that were actually relatively easy to change or did all the big impact stuff come with quite weighty uh, kind of changes behind it. Yeah, so I think it's different for different artists mm -hmm. and different kind of actors in the sector. You know, so it's not. I've I've been sort of reflecting this week about a lot of pressure gets put on the artists mm -hmm. to to do all of this, but of course there's loads of people making the sector work in the way that it works, and so it's it's really a roadmap right across that. I think the key thing actually is really that you think about it from the inception. And I mean, this is actually true, not just in live music, but in everything to do with decarbonisation and tackling climate change. You have to think about it right from the beginning, because otherwise it's too easy to get to the end and then say, oh, well, we can't, we can't do it like that now. Um, and so, you know, if you think about it right from the inception, then it's about how you route, and that then means that you can pick different forms of transport, how you design the show means you're moving less stuff. So mm. I'd say that's my main thing, really, thinking about it right from the beginning. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> Teresa, we'll ask you the same question. What have you been working <coughs> on? Uh, right, well, if those of you who don't know us, Greener Festival was founded in 2006, and we aim to help... Well, it started with music festivals, but it spread much more broadly. Um, events, touring, um, arenas and you'll know a little bit about that now, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to uh, understand their environmental impact and reduce it. Um, recently, this year, in fact, September, we launched our Greener Arena uh, certification, and that's what we do. We go in, um, we look at what events, what music festivals, venues are doing, and um, advise them on um, you know, how to improve um, mm -hmm. and reduce the environmental impact. The other thing we've done is um, launched our Greener Tour this mm -hmm. year, and it's sort of good timing with <coughs> um, obviously massive attacks, um, work and your work, and um, Coldplay as well. Um, Amazing. Great, and I, I guess the same, same question to you. Is there anything specific that you've seen? Is there a trend that's kind of happened over the, you know, the last few years where there's you know, specific changes that are happening and you're seeing that that's really motivating change or you know, it's, it's kind of catalyzing kind of bigger change. And, and, and would, well, I guess, would you also say that that's something that you're seeing? Are you seeing that there's progress in the sector? I think there is progress. I think it's come very quickly, actually, in the last 18 months. Um, before, what we've always seen is festivals, um, venues, very few artists, all working on their own. And what we've suddenly seen is a coming together of certainly the live music industry. So we're starting to see a bit more of a joined up approach. And that uh, sort of happened through UK Live and their, their launch of Live Green this mm -hmm. summer. So I think that's the real 
the real progress is people working together across the industry and all facing the same direction. Amazing. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. I think, that, yeah, we know that collaboration is going to be a, a kind of clear route to, to making some things happen. Um, Sophie, can you tell us what you're up to? Yeah, so I'm here wearing the hat of um, an ambassador, I think, today for Earth Present, who are a quite newly established charity looking to engage the music sector in the climate fight. Um, Brian Eno founded it because there's a lot of charities out there that are not really being funded enough. We know that the environmental kind of world isn't being funded in any way near as much as it needs to be at the moment with this fight. So um, it's a mechanism to engage the music sector to join the climate fight. Um, anyone in the music sector can join. And um, it's called Earth Percent because essentially it's a form of mechanism to get the percentage of some kind of income from artists and anyone else in the music industry to um, give back to mm -hmm. the climate. And I mean, it's been, it's been a tough few years for the music industry and you guys launched this year. How have you found the uptake? Do you, have you found that people have been responsive in spite of what's happened, or, if, you know, how does, how does that look for you? So I think that the, well, as you were saying, there is a huge, um, the climate crisis is imminent, but it's also become quite a cool sector to be in now, which is quite strange because I've been working in it for 10 years and it really wasn't cool 10 years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think it is the moment for the music sector to really pick up and to be ahead of the game, because they normally are, we are normally are ahead of the game in many other ways, but we really are quite behind at the moment. So I think it's, it's been very well, well um, yeah, received, and it's nice to feel like we're part of a big family and everybody kind of coming together to be part of the climate and music industry. So I think it's, an, it's a nice place to be at the moment. Yeah, amazing. And, and for anyone that doesn't know, this, this event is all partnered with Earth Percent, so they're our kind of charity partner, and this is a, a not-for-profit, so yeah. And we're also working with the Greener Festival to kind of calculate our carbon for this event, so that's great. Well, tell Hello. us a little about what you do. Uh, I work for Beggars Group. Beggars Group is, as you've heard, the biggest probably independent record label in the world. We distribute music for like uh, Adele, uh, all the way through to Queens of the Stone Age, uh, the XX. Uh, lots of kind of big and small independent artists on their head of sustainability have been there a year. My job's kind of like split into two areas, one of which is like a relatively granular business change program. How do I make our products better? How do we get them around the world in a more efficient way? How do I uh, stop our executives wanting to fly so much? And then the other half is trying to bring the whole of the record industry along with us because there's no point in beggars trying to do this on our own. We need all the different players across the industry to work with us very closely. Following the leadership of Ninja Tune, who have been working on these projects for years, we're getting the majors involved, we're getting Spotify involved, all kind of pulling in the same direction um, to create tangible, very structural changes, which is obviously what we need to confront the climate crisis. Yeah. Um, separately to that, I'm setting up a, a new initiative called Murmur, and the purpose of that group is to try and help arts organisations use their money to offset or move beyond offsetting and find really impactful ways to support kind of very uh, impactful climate initiatives. Um, so yeah, a few nice. different strands there. Does that yeah. kind of make sense? Yeah, absolutely it does. I mean, again, pulling out the point of collaboration. I think this is something that you know, we've all discussed, and I think from various other talks and things that we've seen, it seems to always come back to that. We're not going to do it on our, on our own. Don't expect someone else to be able to do it on their own. Um, but this is kind of where the real power is. And actually, I think we're, we're feeling that movement, and it's certainly in the industry now, maybe we're a little bit later to it than some others, but feels that the, the kind of pickup is there. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys something else here. So <coughs> I, I would like to know from each of you maybe what are the big opportunities that you can see? And if we go around again, I think it would be really nice to kind of see, you know, a vision of the future, the work that you've done kind of as up to today and where that might head, um, you know, kind of, pie in the sky, but let's try and get there. So, yeah, I mean, I, the big opportunity, I think, is that, you know, we talk a lot about, like, net zero or carbon neutral, and that mashes together these two sides of getting, actually getting your emissions down, which is what we need to do, 
and the offsetting side of it, or the negative emissions of sucking CO2 out of the air side of it. And I think the big opportunity is to move beyond just talking about these big carbon neutral goals, but to instead always be talking about how we get the emissions down, because that is, that is what really matters. And this collective, where you can then sort of stand up and say, that is what you're doing, um, you're going to keep learning, you might get some stuff wrong, but you're going you're to talk about when you get it right and when you get it wrong, because that's how you can share it and scale it. So I think this sort of sense of like collaboration and you know, a movement that pulls together. And then it feels less scary, I think, for somebody to stand up and say, we're going to do this on our tour, um, and we know that we might not get it all right, but we're going to, you know, we're going to, but we're going to genuinely engage with that emissions reduction part, and not the kind of just the big, you know, what what is a carbon neutral anything really? I mean, I, I you know, I, I want it to know that it's super low carbon before I know that it's that it's carbon neutral, and I think that that is a, something we could do with more people standing up and doing it because they maybe feel slightly less vulnerable to do that as a as a collective. Nice. Yeah, love that. <laughs> Teresa? Yeah, I, I think there are two aspects that I'd like to pick up on. One, again, it's the collaboration. And what's really great with the Tyndall Centre coming in is, is the collaboration between industry and academia, the science, to, um, to really sort of beef up everything that, you know, we think is yeah. happening from the industry side with, you know, providing the science. Now all we need is government. And then we'd have a nice, well, I think a nice triumvirate, wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing I think um, we've been looking at for some time, but I think we're in this position now, is to scale up ambition. Mm -hmm. So um, Massive Attack, Coldplay, if you look at particularly Coldplay's website and you see their sustainability plan, mm -hmm. it's all laid out. And a, and a band like Coldplay or Massive Attack, they've got huge following. They've got mm -hmm. a sort of global stage. And they're not perhaps, well, maybe the Elon Musks of, and everybody hates it when I mention him, but actually <laughs> we need that scale of ambition to drive everything forward, to actually... Mm -hmm turn it into reality. Mm -hmm. So, but I think we're on the cusp of that um, and we can do so much in the music industry. And so would you agree it's, you know, probably better not, not to take the us and them approach even when some, maybe <laughs> some of it is quite questionable, but, but still try and encourage collaborative work? Absolutely. I, th I think us and them is just destructive really. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that working together, I'm, I'm personally very keen on this whole theory informs practice, practice mm -hmm. informs theory. We can all learn from each other, as Carly was saying. Um, and so, yeah, we, you know, it's collaboration. But mm -hmm. I'd like to see government really coming in. You know, it's all very well, as you said, setting policies, but we really need action. We need those to be turned into reality, which yeah. is what we're trying to do yeah. here. Amazing. Sophie, I big feel opportunities. like I want to, to stream on from you. It's like mm. the, the, we have the targets in place now if we take it back from the music industry, but we look at the kind of globe, there are global targets. That's why we're here in Glasgow currently. Mm. So these targets exist and our ambition is there. As you say, it's all about the implementation, how we get this done. So enough of the kind of blah, 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 as Greta says, and actually getting action done, which is why we need toolkits, we need, we need, we need the data, and we need the ways of, of, of actually making change. But the, the, the thing that I'm kind of most excited about, I suppose, is this um, shift in values and, and people beginning to, to start to think about life in a very different way that's not about profit and more about regeneration. And so, you know, music has been at the beginning of many, many different um, transformation, transformative journeys. And music can, it's such a small sector that it can be at the forefront of this. Mm -hmm. And so if we have the right tools, like Julie's Bicycle have a lot of amazing tools, you know, you guys have a lot of amazing tools. If we use them in the right way and, and bring them all together and, and ha help people quite directly make change, then we can do it fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... It's Amazing. time. <laughs> Amazing. I love that. Great. Great. Well, um, look, from my perspective, I think that having worked in lots of different industries before, what I realise is that overall, when you look at the environmental impact of the arts and on music, it's quite small. We're not a bank. We're not an airline. Uh, we don't make lots of buildings. Um, but what we do have is an incredible platform to advocate for these issues. 
and um, you know, set about making or, or kind of igniting social change. And that's the magic of the music industry. And that's the magic of the arts, more generally, the ability to tell a really compelling story and take um, sustainability conversations, which are steeped, unfortunately, in like really technical discourse, <laughs> and make it understandable to a really wide audience. That's like the beauty of the arts and music, and that's the opportunity that we all have here. Decarbonisation is really important. Of course it is. Um, I also think it's important for businesses to take responsibility for those original residual emissions they can't reduce yet, and that's kind of what Murmur will look to help with. Uh, but that's, that's the beauty of the arts, man, like communicating <laughs> to lots of different people in a really compelling way. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's the opportunity that we have. Amazing. No, I, I, I love that, and brings me neatly onto the next point, so I'm going to yeah, stick sure. with you if that's all right. I mean, we, you know, we talk about the arts, this, you know, we're here as a kind of at the intersection of culture and climate action, we're, we're recognising the role that culture has. And I think that that is definitely, it feels like it's being thrown to the forefront at this point. I'm conscious of not putting the emphasis just on the artists. You know, I think it's really important that we acknowledge there is an entire industry behind those artists. They may be the mouthpiece if they so choose, but it's really up for us to create the support mechanisms that allow them to be vocal. Um, so I guess, you know, working at a label, I, I guess I want to get a kind of read on what that looks like for you and, and maybe, again, what, what you can see happening in the future, what the best possible outcomes would be when it comes to engaging with artists. It's a really difficult conversation to have because you're asking an artist to stick their head above the parapet yeah. and they're, they're going to get criticised. Of course they will, which is a real shame. Um, uh, but what the job of the supporting industry is to help pass on knowledge to artists in a really efficient way. Uh, is to provide a really robust platform for them to speak about these issues. So until we take action to decarbonise in a really um, targeted manner, um, it's unfair of us to expect artists to have to speak out about these issues. We need to empower them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the key, getting our own houses in order and then passing on that knowledge to artists in a really compelling way to allow them to speak about these issues. Um, and that's important. There's some recent research that came out that said that 90% of people on social media follow an artist or a band and you're twice as likely to follow an artist as you are a politician. It's mental, <laughs> right? So now when someone asks me what we need to do to solve the climate crisis, of course we need like, compelling legislative frameworks, but we also need artists to stand up and talk about those issues. And the best way to do that is to give them a good platform through supporting industries. Amazing. And Sophie, you, you know, you're working with Brian Eno on this, on this project. I mean, that's a pretty clear-cut culture meets climate action initiative there. How else do you engage with artists? And, and how have you found kind of... Uh, like key members of the community who are willing to take part in that? Uh, what does that look like and, and how do you guys support them? So it's funny because it's like as the shift is in what's happening with kind of the attention of the climate world is happening, um, there's always people at the forefront, right? So we have got the people that are really engaged and excited about working with us currently are people who are already part of the climate fight, but their platforms will already sing out to other people. And so it's just this kind of domino effect of, mm -hmm. of when one person gets in, involved, then another person will. Um, but I think, it's, it, I think we really are focusing around this kind of family concept and um, for people to feel really cradled and nurtured in, in a safe place to then go out and make change. Because essentially, even though the music industry has to be behind artists and it, you know, the full attention shouldn't be on artists, it is. And particularly in the music industry, you know, neurologically, we're known, music is known to evoke emotion in us. And if we're not emotional as part of this kind of climate fight, then we're not going to get anywhere because data doesn't change your mind. And data isn't, you know, data doesn't say, data's just for a lot of people, just a number and a stat, and it doesn't mean anything. Whereas if music kind of sings about, like Sam Lee, who is now part of Earth Percent, he sings from our lands. He takes songs from our lands and sings about them. And I've seen him a few times over COP and people have been crying, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a very, like, visceral experience. And I think that's what we really need to do is, like, as I was saying earlier, reevaluate what's important. And music is key to that. And so I do feel for musicians for having to be put on a pedestal, but they're already on a pedestal. So mm -hmm. let's hope to support them in getting the right message across and, and knowing that, you know, what their proceedings are going towards is something good that's linked to kind of climate justice and making systemic change and reducing emissions. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Resonates, for sure. And uh, yeah, I think we're all 
hearing that it's, it's, uh, we're all in this together. So let's, let's try and make the best of it that we can. Um, I want to ask you now, um, maybe for a couple of things that people can look out for in the future. So, you know, conscious that there's been lots of changes, especially with Greener Festival, and you've worked with many festivals now over the years. As a festival goer, what is it that someone's looking out for? How are, they, how are we going to help kind of sow the seed of something that is, might change their mind for the rest of their lives when they're in a place that, you know, is a, it's a captive audience? And that might also sway their decision as to whether they go or not. Could you give us some examples of changes that you've made that have really demonstrated kind of consumer behavior shifts? Um, I think I'm going to put a caveat to that. Okay. Um, having been on lots of festival sites, particularly festival campsites, and doing a lot of research into this, I think, let me give you an example. I guess 10 years ago, maybe a bit longer, um, when we started a greener festival, um, and we were asking the question, so, you know, what do you think about um, the CO2 emissions for an event? The majority of people had never heard, never heard of it. wasn't part of the conversation. wasn't part of. That's now. You know, most people have heard of it. They may not know exactly what it means, um, but they've heard of it. Um, when I go on site um, and talk to people, um, they, I have to remind myself that I'm immersed in all of this, like everybody and that still there is a proportion of people out there who are not. Mm -hmm. It's not part of their daily lives. It's not part of the concerns that face them, you know, every day. And when they go to a festival, they want to relax, they want to forget, they want to have a party, they want to enjoy themselves. And we have to remember that if we're going to, to reach people, mm -hmm. um, because that's why they're there. They're not there to necessarily radically overhaul their lifestyle, mm -hmm. etc. So um, the sort of messaging, I think it's important from the artists, but the best way to do it that we see at some of the fantastic green events, um, as Carly said, is embedded. It's just having every aspect of the event just supports the idea that you know, sustainability is the way forward, that it's green. So whether it's visible waste separation, which is sort of mm -hmm. clearly visible, but every single aspect from food to energy to how water is dealt with to the toilets, you know, everything mm -hmm. on a live site should support that aspiration. And then it sort of seeps into you. You know, it's an organic thing, isn't it? Rather mm -hmm. than somebody saying, right, we're going to go green today. You need to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, it just let it happen organically. And some of those things that you've mentioned, you know, I've certainly been on festival sites where you notice those things. Do you think they're, are they relatively easy to implement? Do you think that people recognise that those things are, you know, are there for that reason? Um, there, is, there is a group, you know, as always a percentage of people who are totally on board with it. They know what's, what it's all about. You know, they're seasoned festival goers. They make their choices, etc. But there's a lot who, who are sort of aware, but it's, as I say, it's not... It's getting mm -hmm. to the main... How far is the main stage from this campsite? Mm -hmm. You know, and how long is it going to take me to get there? And what am I going to eat? And stuff like that. And, oh, God, the toilet queue. It's, you know... Don't, they stink and I don't want to go there. Um, so it has to be much more, I think it has to be more subtle than that. It mm -hmm. has to be part of, become part of the concerns. So, you know, those toilets um, that you're queuing for shouldn't stink. We did a great thing at Download Festival, um, Greenpeace, the eco site, um, put on the vacuum toilets and people were coming onto that particular campsite because it smelt so sweet. <laughs> Next door, you know, blue chemicals stunk. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's that, I think this is the way to change. Just make it nicer and easier to do and, you know, a better experience. To me, that's how, how to go about it. I'm curious about that. What was the difference between the two? The one well, was the blue chemical and one was just, just smelt like roses. So there's no chemicals. Amazing. It's just all into sort of sealed bags or obviously compost is the other way forward. So you don't Great. get that, whew, you know, <laughs> that hits you sort of half a mile away. You know, yeah. you're, you're near a festival. Um, yeah. Yeah, amazing. 
Great. So some really good specific examples there. So, Carly, I'd like to maybe dive a little bit deeper into the work that you've been doing and maybe pull out a few specifics, if that's okay. Um, so, you know, obviously the work with Massive Attack, they're leading the charge and I think a real inspiration for a lot of kind of artists, but also the industry. You know, I think it would be nice for, the, for us to have an industry that kind of met them where they are. Um, what's the kind of things that they're doing uh, on the road now and how do they... How have they communicated it with their fans? Yeah, so I mean, I suppose what I found really exciting about working with them is when they came to us, you know, like we're, we're totally new to the music industry, like all these guys have been doing it for ages. You know, we're, you know, researchers who are interested in decarbonisation of everything. And, you know, I'm interested in music, but, you know, we weren't experts in it. And so it was, it was interesting for them to come to us and they wanted that kind of distance, I think, actually, in the sense that we'd done this with other sectors and things like that. But what was really exciting about working with them was that I, they, they, really, they really get it and have really, I think, been kind of troubled by the sense that they're doing something that's, that's very carbon intensive. They absolutely get that there is a climate emergency and, you know, can they keep doing this? Mm -hmm. And so rather than coming to us and saying, right, we need a report to sort of, you know, to put on the back of the next tour, they were really much more in a space that was like, should we stop touring? And if, if, you, if, you, if you say that that's what it is we have to do, so, they were, you know, very, very open to, from, you know, what's happening now to not doing it at all. And if you can make anything in the middle, you know, that would be, that would be great. And I, you know, I totally agree with these guys that the power of music and culture is massive in, in what mm. we're trying to do to tackle climate change. And that you have to then get your own house in order to be able mm -hmm. to, to speak about those, about those things. And so I think you know, that it's part of like, the joy of being a human to be able to go to a gig and sing along. And you know, we, mm. I, I don't want to say that we shouldn't be doing that as part right. of our, our response to climate change. So that gave us a real kind of open space to work with. But the other thing that's great about working with them is they're already doing lots of it. So on their, their, their last tour before uh, the pandemic, you know, they flew to a hub and then they got the, the trains mm -hmm. one, when they were there. And, I, and what's really powerful for me for that is that as academics, I think if we came in and said artists could be getting on the train, it's a bit like, who are these guys? Like, mm -hmm. the artists aren't going to be getting on the trains. Well, these guys are. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's doable, it's possible. Um, and so, you know, our roadmap doesn't have no aviation in it, but it is about building in alternatives. And I think if what we're seeing is a part of this carbon that we, that this residual carbon that we can't get rid of, that, you know, we need nature-based solutions to, to balance out, um, if a part of that we're saying we're going to spend on music because it's so important, then I don't think it's too big an ask to say you've got to do everything you can to keep that as low as, as possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it might, it might mean you have to think about it differently. It might take a little bit longer, um, but actually that means the whole, thing, the whole thing can work. So I think that's cool that they're doing. The other thing that came out of the roadmap is around uh, festivals. And so if, if festivals are being powered by diesel generators, the gap between having a grid connection, so just the national grid that you're using in your own house, mm -hmm. and generating that power through a diesel generator, the gap of the carbon intensity of that is widening because we're actually been quite good at decarbonizing the grid. So we've halved the carbon emissions in the national grid in the last 10 years. So diesel generators look comparatively worse. And like what we've said in the roadmap is, Try to get a grid connection if you can. Obviously, sometimes that is not possible. So then it's about unleashing like, the innovation in the sector to say, well, then match the grid, match the grid emissions. So use mm. solar and batteries. Get your emissions, you know, get, your, get your demand right down. Think about what your peak demand's doing um, and really unleash that. And we haven't tried to say exactly how you do that because we think it's people in the industry that can do that. So what we're trying to do is step back a bit and say, these are the big kind of headline targets. This is where you need to be to be kind of Paris climate change mm -hmm. agreement aligned. But the actual real power to do that and how that will manifest for each artist and each event will be different. And that's where we are now. I, I hope that people can say, right, I want to be part of that and I'm going to work out how to do it for our, for our own area. Um, because there's not one solution for, uh, for, for, every, for every situation. Yeah, I mean, you know, we know that all artists are unique and I think, as, you, as you've said, I think those solutions will be bespoke, but exploring... That's the, that's the key. Um, an amazing dedication from the guys. It sounds like they were ready to hang up their guitars and get, get jobs in some, some other industry <laughs> if they can well, solve I think, the problem. You know, I think the big difference is if that's where you get to, you think, can I do this thing that I love and I've done for decades and really is a central part of who I am? Maybe I can't do that anymore. If you then say, 
Right, well, from that position, instead of not doing it, you can just really throw everything at doing it in a different way. That's actually very empowering. Mm. That's a different angle to come in than, I'm currently doing it this way, I really like, like selfies on the steps of my private jet, um, and I, li I like that sort of, you know, that, that kind of framing, and I've worked really hard to get that, and I've, want, and I've you know, mm -hmm. wanted that. It's, it, does, it does land as a different message into that context. Mm. So I think it is about working, it, to begin with, with people who really feel that tension, then you show it works, and then it just becomes what everybody does. We, you know, in, in all areas of decarbonisation, I think you get people that are like, well, that's, that'll never work, We've, you, know, we, you can't do it like that. And particularly for events, because you've got this point of failure where you know, it absolutely has to work, it cannot fail. So coming along and being like, we've got this cool new way of doing it. It's a bit risky, but uh, let's go for it. Obviously, the people that are in charge of making a show work don't want to do that. So you've got to build it up and get the confidence in different ways of doing it so that then it just becomes like, just becomes that's how we, that's how we always do it. Yeah, amazing. Uh, that's really inspiring stuff. And I think that change in perspective is going to be what we, what we need. Um, brilliant. I think we're going we're gonna to take some, some questions, but just before we do, um, I want to go around each of you and ask for one key takeaway that everyone in the audience can, can kind of have with them today. Um, something that can be an inspiring action or a statement or a question that we can ask ourselves. Um, so, Will, I'm going, to, I'm going to start with you if that's okay. So, one, one little tidbit. I, I think what I hear all over the place this week is the importance of civil society. Everyone in this audience just using your voice to ask questions, to encourage artists to talk about these issues, to congratulate them when they do. Um, uh, to get in touch with your MP, to, you know, to keep pushing, to keep advocating for change, um, because that's that sort of groundswell movement feeding into the structures that you know, manage our country. That's, that's where those power relationships lie. So, yeah, keep, keep talking about it, keep advocating for change. I think that's the key. Yeah, really nice. Sophie? I, I like that. <laughs> um, I would agree. I, 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 before COP, I was going to say only vote for a party that has a 1.5 degree mandate, which I still agree with. But now I think um, there's, a, there's a deep need for us to, as I said earlier, like reevaluate ourselves. So I'm going to say just the word community and look for a link within your local community and local groups that um, allow you to feel like you're part of a climate community that are um, doing good. Because there are so many climate communities out there that you can all be part of and feel attached to. And they're all, they're all pretty good. They're great people. So great <laughs> advice. Um, Teresa? I'm going to just build on, I think, what you said rather than say anything different. But um, just as individuals, I think it's about this action, personal action, and follow through. Follow through with the choices you make, with the questions you ask when you go to a music gig or you go to a festival, because or any event, actually, just follow through in your own personal actions. Um, I think that's really important. I'm going to throw another one back at you. Mm -hmm. Take your tent home. Uh, yeah. Take your tent home. Yeah, I was trying to avoid it because I spend my whole life thinking about this, which... Uh, I'm not, um, not going to let take you, your I'm tent afraid. Home. Take, 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 take your shit home. Take your shit home. <laughs> if you can take it with you, you can take it back. Yeah. And actually, I, you know... I. I wanted to get that one out because I think it, that tells a much bigger story about kind of, you know, commercialism and, and just mm. waste in general. So I think it's a simple action that really gets people thinking, I think. And it, and it had a huge impact. We, we, you know, we saw two years ago now when a few festivals did that and it was a drastic reduction. So mm. it was brilliant. Mm. Carly? Yeah, I mean, I think it echoes um, the other points made, but... But, but to, to talk about these things that, that you see that you like or that you're doing and you've enjoyed and to, and to you know, kind of ripple that out, it's often framed in quite a kind of negative abstinence kind of way. But actually, you know, this is about a vision of how we do the things we love differently. And actually talking about that is, is really key to make it feel very normal for people to be able to draw on ex, you know, experiences of others where it's, where it's worked. So whatever it is you're doing or whatever it is you've enjoyed that you feel is part of you know, moving in the right direction, mm. you can amplify that um, just by chatting. And who doesn't love chatting? Yeah, really nice. Well, none of us, clearly. So <laughs> that was, yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. So I think we're going to take some questions. Have we got a microphone somewhere and someone to ask some questions? Ah, 
Hey, Joel with the microphone. Any questions from anyone? Someone at the back there? Great. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you very much for everything you're saying and also running this event for all you guys as well. So thank you. Um, so my name's Chris. Um, I work for a company called Media Research and we have a consumer survey, like global, about 10,000 people. And we ask a lot of questions about music behaviors, attitudes, and also broader entertainment. We want to get a question in there about what consumers' attitudes are to climate change and like what brands are doing about climate change as well. And so on the topic of like data and asking questions, what data from like the consumer side do you want to see that's going to be useful, help you make like positive actions? Um, so yeah, put in your orders, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good question. One of the <laughs> projects I'm working on at the moment is to try and run like a fan survey because I don't have any data which tells me really in a granular sense what fans think about sustainability in music or really what artists think in a broader sense as well. And then in other industries I've worked in, that's really powerful data to have because you can take information about a company's uh, consumers to a board or to a group of business executives and say, like, this is what your customers think. So that work needs to be done, so I'm really glad you're doing it. Um, in the most like, simple sense, uh, a question of you know, trying to understand what fans think about sustainability would be really useful. Um, specific questions. Um, I'd stay away from anything really granular. Um, a lot of people talk very directly about issues like shrink wrap, for example, which uh, these issues are something that the industry should be solving without really the input of fans and consumers because we're the experts, so we should just come up with the answers to that. Uh, but, you know, big questions. Um, what do they think about sustainability? What do they think artists should be doing? Um, you know, how they best receive information, how informed are they about these topics, and where would they like, you know, more evidence-based kind of answers would be really useful, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but a good bit of work. Nice. Cool. Thank you. Great. Can I just come back on yeah, that one? Yeah, of course. Um, there is something called the attitude behaviour gap, and it's something we have to be aware of when we put out these surveys, that what people say is not necessarily what they do. So I would would personally reframe that into choices. What choices do you make? And then have your range of whatever it is you want to put in there. Because I think we just have to be careful that we draw too much from attitudes um, and, and think that translates into behavior. Mm. Yeah, nice. Great point, thank you. Any other questions? I think we've probably got time for one or two more. Can I just, when someone else oh, is asking that, I, yeah. I think that one of the, the biggest issues currently in the music business is the fact that we don't have data, so it's, it's really important that you're doing this. Um, but it's, it's quite, uh, I'd, I'd like to know more about the kind of consumption data, so whether it's how much time they spend listening to music on what platform, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, to then have a kind of more uh, UK-wide understanding of, of how often things are listened to and, and what it is that they're listening to. Um, music on. This amount of people are going to actually take action about it, and we can see that they're clustered more on people who listen to music more, or people who listen to like hip-hop more, or people mm. who listen to Spotify more. Um, so that's the kind of goal with it. And yeah, it'd be good to follow this up and get some more like input to help guide sure. us with it. It would also be good to get um, Spotify and streaming sites to let us know how much um, data is really being used, because that's still a big unknown at the moment. Mm. Nice. Any other questions? Oh, there's a couple over here. Yeah, those are some good ones. Do we get some? Are you getting some DSP data? Some? Uh, we don't have any direct access at the moment, but Spotify You're are currently running a brilliant program with University of Bristol to like map that whole emission Great. supply chain. So it's coming. Nice, nice. Yeah, just another another question. Um, I guess more from a general point of view, you've referenced Coldplay, you've referenced Massive Attack, and you've also said that climate change is now becoming cooler. Um, from a general point of view, across the board, are you seeing that the music community is starting to really care 
are things changing? It's really interesting that we have a record label um, saying we're taking a stand around climate change. I'm just interested in, is now the time where there is a kind of like a sea change in what's happening within the music industry? And uh, is there any words of encouragement just to, to sort of like highlight that and to, um, yeah, just interested in your views on that? Artists, I think, have always cared about sustainability in climate change. It's not a new thing. The supporting industries are really late to the game, like especially the recorded music industry uh, have only really started, besides a few you know, very early takers up of these issues, like Ninja Tune. As a whole, the industry is really late and only started talking about these things really this time last year and coming together as a group to discuss them. So we're really late to the game. The artists aren't. They've been thinking about these issues for a while. Bands have been writing about these issues. We had... A few groups last year, Goat Girl released an album almost entirely about climate change. This is the kit, been writing about these issues for years. Tom York and Radiohead on XL, one of our labels, he's been you know, very publicly advocating about this stuff for a long time. And that's really important. But now is the time for the supporting industry to step up and to give all those artists a really great platform to empower them to pass on knowledge, um, to like, help that ground swell uh, develop much more quickly. Um, so, so you're right, I think we will see a bit more of a sea change. We will see artists talk about these issues and take a stance much more regularly. Um, but yeah, it's certainly not too little too late. Um, but the, now is the time, yeah, for sure. Amazing. Well, the other thing is ev like the people that are, that are part of this community that are kind of at the front of the, the wave are all just really generous, open and kind people that want to help. So anybody that wants to get involved and be part of the family just needs to get in touch and they'll get an email back and we'll come to the events and talk about things and look at how we can make change together. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Nice. Okay, last, last question, please. Hello. Um, I think it's, it's awesome that bands, you know, like Massive Attack and Coldplay are able to, to make those changes in their tours. And I guess my question would be that how would bands with not so big budgets and not the ability to be able to take that step, step back and say that I'm either not going to play or make a difference? A lot of the time, I think the solution we're told is travel, but sometimes that just isn't within the budget for, for small independent bands. So are there some kind of like unlikely heroes that actually can help solve a few problems on a, on a low budget level, I guess? Yeah, I mean... I think it's really important that you look across at the kind of the different areas of power, if you like, uh, that, that different actors have, not just, not just artists, but right across the sector. And I think it, it's so urgent now to, to cut emissions. Like, we've spent so long talking about it, and global emissions have just continued to go up. So everything has to, has to get to very close to zero very quickly. So it is about doing whatever, whatever you can. Now, if you're, if you're a smaller artist, um, not doing as much, actually, your emissions, your emissions are already lower. Um, and those, those bigger bands, I think what's really exciting is they, can, they, they could frame this to leave a legacy. So if they make exciting partnerships, so like Massive Attack, for example, do a lot of work with Ecotricity, um, looking at kind of different partnerships for venues and actually getting like new renewable supply. They don't then, you know, they don't take that with them once they've played, you know, like that. Those, so, you know, that's not all happening just quite yet, but those kind of conversations where actually this leads to a change in what's then left for everybody. If you shifted to more like a plug and play type framing of, of how, you know, that kind of business model, that would, that would filter down and benefit lots of, you know, other bands. So I think, you know, looking really, again, thinking from the inception, every bit of what you do, what are the impacts of that? What are the alternatives? How could we, how could we reduce it? And even if we can't get rid of everything at the moment, how could we make a, you know, a good chunk into that? Um, that's what everyone needs to be doing, and, that, and people will have different levels of it. But it's that genuine commitment to trying to actually reduce your emissions. You don't have to be zero now. You know, it's like, it's a sort of trick, I think, um, to make people feel powerless because in a deeply carbon-intensive world, they can't live a carbon-free life. You know, like, well, of course we can't. Like, the whole, the whole you know, you can't, you can't do anything without it having a, a carbon implication. But you can, but that means you also can reduce it by everything that you, that you do. So not being able to get to zero overnight doesn't mean you can't make a big difference. Mm. Thank you. Really nice. And thank you for making that point. I think there is an element of that which is being compassionate to yourself. If you want to make the change, if you want to be active, do it in a way that is 
yeah, you know, genuine for yourself. Um, and don't expect to be able to do it overnight. We're, we are progressing, we're, we're taking that step. Um, but yeah, the, the solutions aren't always there for, for people at the bottom. So yeah, great, great that you want to be involved. Thank you. Um, I think we'll, we'll kind of end on that note. I think that was brilliant. So please give a, a, a round of applause to our panelists today. Fantastic. Thank you all very much. <laughs>